Hi there. Thanks for joining us for this panel. Uh, my name is Michael Chandler. I'm an education reporter at the Washington Post. I'm happy to be here. Um, we're going to talk about um, put, put these common core debates um, in an international context. Um, of course, a driving motivation behind the move to common core standards has been uh, the U.S.'s middling performance on these international tests. And also the, the relatively recent realization that whereas the U.S. once enjoyed this dominance in things like college attainment and academic performance, that um, the U.S. had actually slipped. And other countries that um, just a generation or two generations ago in many cases uh, were largely destitute have um, really improved their economies or um, have booming economies that they have built on the backs of a smarter, better educated workforce. Um, in the last panel, the comment was made by one of the panelists that you can look at a country or a city or a state, see that it's done better, but you have no idea what made it better. Uh, I actually don't agree with that. Uh, what we've done is look at the 10 top performers as defined by the rankings on the PISA OECD surveys. And what we were looking for when we looked was to see what characteristics, what strategies those countries were pursuing in common, but not the United States. That is a very strong indicator that they're doing something important that we need to pay attention to. And um, what was so striking about the research that we've done over the last 25 years is that there is a very coherent set of strategies they have been pursuing, which we have not. Uh, the list I'm about to share with you is certainly not complete. It's indicative. Um, so uh, there's a lot more detail, in other words, underneath each one of them. Uh, almost all of these countries have been radically changing their school finance policies so that um, on balance, they are providing more resources to kids who are harder to educate than those who are easier, easier to educate. The opposite of what the United States has been doing. That's number one. Number two, you will find in virtually all of these countries that some combination of culture and policy produces very strong support for children and families, young children and families. Third, you will find in all of these countries, to come back to your question, uh, they all have strong standards. They are either expressed as a, uh, a set of standards in American style, that is a list of things that students should know and be able to do, uh, or they are part of um, specification uh, of their curriculum in, uh, in the syllabi that they provide uh, for teachers in their country. Either way, high standards. Um, that comes directly to the next one. They have very integrated instructional programs and policies, by which I mean, whereas we look at standards, curriculum, instruction, and assessment separately, they look at them as all four aspects of one and the same thing, which is their instructional system. And they make sure it's highly aligned, it's coherent, and set to very high standards. Next, and when you talk to people in these other countries, possibly most important is teacher quality. All of these countries have been moving toward much higher teacher quality. One way of thinking about that is simply to look at the segment of high school graduates they are recruiting into teaching. In the United States, that's the bottom third. In the countries that we've been looking at, it's on the order of the top quarter and on up. In Finland, it's the top 10%. In South Korea, it's the top 5%. And um, finally, not quite finally, um, uh, an area that I can, we, we don't really have a good phrase for. It's a blend of vocational uh, education and training and school to work. They have systems, um, highly elaborated systems, uh, that they spend much more time worrying about than we do for transitioning kids from school into the workforce with a lot of support in these countries. Again, those systems look very different. The common characteristic is they're there and they're strong. The last one is probably the most important of all. Uh, in all of these countries or other jurisdictions which constitute the top 10, um, you will find a Ministry of Education, which is where the buck stops on education policy and implementation. They're strong agencies, they're well-funded, they typically can draw on a very strong 
a group of uh, highly educated people. And the result is they have very coherent policies and systems, each part of which is designed to support the other. The countries that I focused on where I followed American exchange students for a year were Finland, South Korea, and Poland. Poland does not have the results, obviously, of Finland and Korea, but has dramatically improved its outcomes over the past 10 years, despite having a 15% child poverty rate. So that was why that was of interest. Um, in each case, it is definitely true that they have all sort of swallowed their pride and huddled up and agreed on a more coherent, more rigorous list of what kids should know. Um, and Finland, until 1985, had a 700-page curriculum that was pretty scripted, right, Mark? And, uh, and it was in very small font. And it was a period when there was not a, a lot of trust for teachers. It was a much more top-down, not, not quite the same level of accountability, but still, you know, there were national inspectors who came to your school you had to submit an annual detailed plan for your school to, for approval from the National uh, Inspector's Office, which uh, the, the central government approved all the textbooks. I mean, it was pretty, it was pretty controlling. Um, but they still had this pretty scripted curriculum until 1985 when they cut it down 50% to about 300 pages and gave schools and teachers much more autonomy um, and really kind of lifted the ceiling on what was possible. So this was this is sort of golden era that teachers in Finland get kind of misty-eyed when they talk about, because they really included teachers in that process. And now there was trust, because they'd done that work on the pipeline of teachers as well. So it's, you know, the Finnish union ran an advertisement in the 80s that said, Finland has the best educated teachers in the world. Full stop. I mean, that's a remarkable claim to make.